Welcome back to the show. Today we're talking about team culture. A lot of times we hear people talk about winning culture teams versus losing culture teams. But while winning is something you strive for, it really doesn't define an ethos of principles and values that a team sets to uphold. What I've noticed is there really aren't any NBA teams as organizations that have an ethos. Unlike there are any NBA teams that have a core understanding or purpose that influence the way they hire, the way they draft, the way they coach, or just generally conduct business. Except for the Miami Heat, who are so bought into their brand that their new city jerseys explicitly say it. I'm sure you all have heard of heat culture, but maybe you don't know exactly what the pillars of heat culture are. So let's start here. Heat culture is defined as the hardest working, best conditioned, most professional, unselfish, toughest, meanest, nastiest team in the NBA. Who came up with this definition? That would be president of the Miami Heat, Pat Riley. Pat Riley has been a part of this organization since 1995 when he became head coach. The Heat as a team have only been around since 1988. So Riley has been a major influence in the organization since its inception, basically. But what does Pat Riley know about basketball? Why is the ideal culture that he created taken so seriously? It's because Pat Riley is one of the most successful NBA figures of all time. As a player, as a coach, and an executive. Over the past 50 two years, Pat Riley has seen the finals 19 times. That's more than Phil Jackson. In 2008, though, Pat Riley decided to step down as head coach and step back into his role as an executive. He gave the keys of the car to Eric Spolstra and hired him as the head coach. Keep in mind, Spolstra was 37 years old at the time. I don't know if he was the youngest coach in the NBA at the time, and I don't care enough to look it up, but my point is, he was very young. And not only was he young, he also had really humble beginnings in the organization. He started as a scout, then he was a video coordinator in 1997 and he finally joined the coaching staff as an assistant. So those low-level jobs in the NBA, like scout and video coordinator, pay peanuts. So in some of my research for another video, I found out that Masai Ujiri, who is the current GM of the Toronto Raptors, was a scout for the Orlando Magic. Masai was not paid for this job. In fact, when he was scouting, he had to crash in different people's hotel rooms because he didn't even get his hotel room covered. So I'm saying this so you know that guys that weren't former players or Nepo babies had a lot to sacrifice to make it this far in the league. No disrespect to Nepo babies, it's not their fault that they were born into a position where they didn't have to sacrifice that much. But what it says about Spolstra is that he loved the game and his heart was in it. I'm sure Pat Riley could have gone with a safer bet and just chose one of the rotating carousel of NBA coaches. Your Steve Cliffords, your Stan Van Gundy's, your Mike D'Antonio's of the world. But Riley saw something in Eric Spolstra and you know what he saw? He saw heat culture. He saw a guy who was willing to sit in the tape room, the dungeon as Spo called it, and look at tape all day and analyze different plays. He was a sicko. This is the type of thing that excites me about basketball. This is the opposite of lazy, phone it in, safe bet business operation. The Heat are an organization that care about the project and not about what people think about them. One more thing I want to say about Spo's passion for the game. Spo actually entered the draft in 1992. He wasn't drafted, so he left because he got a job being a player coach in Germany on a team that's so small they don't even have a Wikipedia page. That's how much this guy wanted to just be in the game. I'm sure Spo wasn't fluent in German and he didn't have have friends and family that lived over there for him to hang out with. This had to be a sucky two years for him. So let's cut back to Spoltra as the head coach of the Miami Heat. The season before Spo was the head coach, the Heat were abysmal, with Wade and Shaq experiencing pretty intense injuries. They finished with one of the worst records in NBA history at 15 and 67. But in his first two seasons, Spo was able to get them to the playoffs. So Pat Riley, trusting his mentee and trusting his own judgment, paid off. Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about it later. Then came LeBron's decision when LeBron James and Chris Bosh joined Wayne. Wade and Eric Spolstra in Miami in 2010. This was a major challenge to Heat culture. You had the most famous player in basketball join a team that had a pre-existing ethos. It would be hard to not let LeBron impose his will on the organization. And that's what LeBron tried to do. Allegedly, Spolstra's coaching style was too intense for LeBron. LeBron went to Pat Riley and asked that Spo be fired. Pat Riley said, absolutely not. That is out of the question. This is according to Ronan Katz, a minority owner of the Miami Heat. He said that this is actually actually the reason that LeBron left Miami. So this is actually somewhat verified. The very beginning of the first season that LeBron and Spo were together, Pat Riley says LeBron came to him and said, hey, I want you to coach the team, not Spolstra. Fire Spolstra. Pat Riley said, absolutely not. Eric Spolstra is the coach. I am the president. Good for Pat Riley for not letting his ego get in the way of his instinct. You have the most famous person in basketball flattering you, saying that he wishes you were coaching him and he tells him to fuck 
off. That is heat culture. So now let's talk about Jimmy Butler. In October 2018, Jimmy Butler was on the Minnesota Timberwolves roster, but he made a public trade demand saying that he wanted out of the Timberwolves before the beginning of the season. Jimmy shows up to his first practice in preseason, scrimmages with the third unit against the starters, and kills them. He calls out players like Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns. He calls out Tom Thibodeau, the coach, and he calls out the owner saying, you guys need me. Basically comes into practice saying, I'm going to be a problem for this organization. You better trade me. Now that is what I call nasty. That sounds like the type of nastiness that Pat Riley was talking about. Jimmy Butler was angry that he was part of a losing culture in the Minnesota Timberwolves. Players like Cat, Jeff Teague, and Andrew Wiggins had all gotten used to losing. Losing had no sting. It just became commonplace. This happens all the time, even if you're not a professional basketball player. The scary thing is, a losing mindset sneaks up on you. So inconspicuously that you don't even know it happened. Until a Rolex wearing Jimmy Butler dunks on you in practice and calls you a b Obviously, no one thinks of themselves as a loser. So we find ways to justify the fact that we aren't growing and we aren't making progress with excuses. I have calf soreness. The refs were bad. The coach messed up the rotations. We'll be better when we get a different draft pick. These were all things that Jimmy Butler wasn't trying to hear. This story has been talked about to death even by me, but it's the best example of a team that had no clear ethos. If your goal is to win games, you will never win games. If your goal is to learn Portuguese, you'll never learn Portuguese. If your goal is to learn five Portuguese words, a day, in a month, you'll know 150 Portuguese words. And maybe one day you will have learned Portuguese. My point being, the Heat have a standard to live up to, not a desired outcome. Part of the objective standards for the Heat was that they have a 8% body fat for each player. I don't know if it's that way now. 8% is very lean and it's basically impossible to have if you're not being very conscious of what you're putting into your body. And this standard proved to be too much for Jermaine O'Neal when it came time for him to resign. They wanted me to resign. Like I knew LeBron and him was coming. You know, they got that 8% body fat. I remember going to, I remember going into the pantry at night, looking at the Oreos, Oreos looking at me. <laughs> right? And bro, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 30 plus years old. I, I can't go through this. And the next part of heat culture is embracing conflict. In March, 2022, Jimmy Butler and Eric Spolstra got into conflict that almost came down to blows. But this conflict actually arose from just frustration about how the last couple games had gone. This wasn't some old resentment that one of them had been harboring for months. They were just losing games and in a winning culture, tempers are gonna flare. You also know this is just par for the course when it comes to playing for the Miami Heat. Because look at how the other players are reacting. Nobody looks shocked. They're just trying to continue business as usual. Like they they know this wall just blow over in a matter of hours. Spo even made a joke about it after the game, saying they were just arguing about where they're gonna go eat after the game. Jimmy even said this fight was helpful in galvanizing the team, and you can't argue that he was wrong. The Heat finished top in the East that year. Another important thing to point out about Heat culture is they care about developing their players. I've talked about this before, but Gabe Vincent and Max Struess were on minimum contracts for the Heat, and both of them just signed a $33 million deal and a $62 million deal with different teams this year. I'm sure both of them are very grateful for the effects of Heat culture on their game and their bank accounts. Another unique fact about the Heat is that they keep signing Udonis Haslam to one-year vet minimum deals. Way after he was a viable NBA player, this guy is old. During the last seven seasons, Udonis Haslam has only played 65 games, and most of those minutes came in garbage time. But the Heat saw the importance of having a guy who's embodied Heat culture for 20 years on the roster. No one else is doing this. The Hawks kind of did it with Vince Carter, but typically no one else is doing this. I love watching Haslam be a mentor to guys that are in a younger generation. I think a a lot of teams could benefit from having a long tenured player that could show the guys the ropes and show them how they do things. So while I don't necessarily agree with all the things the Heat do, I have a great deal of respect and admiration for the organization because they stand for something. All right, thanks for being here. Let me know if I got anything wrong or if you know of another team that has a specific culture or ideology that they live by, let me know, because I don't think there is. So I always respond, like the video if you like the video. If you didn't like the video, dislike the video. And uh, be good to your mothers, eat a corn dog.